Uh, my name is Bart Frazier. I'm program director at the Future Freedom Foundation. Uh, we're a nonprofit educational foundation whose mission uh, is to provide an uncompromising vision of economic and individual liberty. Uh, we do it through events like this. Uh, for instance, the Selgin talk from last month uh, was available within two days. Uh, you can watch on the internet. This one will be as well. Have a ton of videos on our website. Uh, we have a monthly publication, which we have free samples of over here uh, on uh, the table, so please uh, come and grab as many as you'd like. Uh, we also have uh, a very good, what we consider the, to be the best, uh, daily newsletter on the Internet. It has all of our original articles, our upcoming events, uh, a collection of libertarian-minded articles uh, called from around the Internet. It's called FFF Daily, and you can subscribe to that for free by sending an email to FFF at FFF.org. Um, and with subscribe in the subject line and, and we'll sign you right up for that. And uh, the last thing I wanted to say is that if you're new to Mason uh, and, or even if you're not new to Mason but you're not a member of the Econ Society, uh, please join. Uh, it's a very active group. Uh, it's a bunch of very enthusiastic students who have a love for liberty and for economics. Um, and they help put on events like this. They have other great events. Um, and uh, the president, David Roth, who's here tonight, he's the person to talk to if you're interested. And uh, I'll let David tell you all about it. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm David Roth, and I'm the president of the Econ Society. The Econ Society is a student organization committed to the personal, professional, and academic development of all students interested in the study of economics. Uh, we, provide, we organize lecture series, discussion sessions, and other interactions between students and professional economists. If you'd like to learn more about the Econ Society, please come speak to me or one of my other officers after the event tonight, or visit us at economics-society.org. It is my pleasure to introduce Ed Crane. Crane is the founder and president emeritus of Cato Institute. Uh, under his leadership, the Cato Institute grew to become one of the nation's most prominent public policy research organizations. Crane has been a pioneer in framing the political debate as not of one between liberal and conservative, but rather between civil society and political society. He was at the forefront of promoting personal accounts in lieu of th the current uh, social security system, and was one of the first national leaders of the term limits movement. Crane is co-editor of several books, publisher of Regulation Magazine, serves on the board on the boards of U.S. Term Limits and the Center for Competitive Politics and is a member of the Mount Pelerin Society. He is, chartered he is a chartered financial analyst and former president of uh, Alliance Capital Management Corp. Please, well, uh, please join me in welcoming Ed Craig. I've always felt in indebted to Bumper Hornberger because he is, is kind of a bumper for me, and people come to me and say, Ed, you're, you're so crazy and radical, you can't be serious. And I say, oh, have you ever talked to Bumper? Because he's, uh, he really goes out there. In any case, uh, I, I have declined in the past to do this because, uh, as you'll soon discover, I don't know anything about economics. And, uh, and yet, uh, and when I told that to Bumper, he said, well, it's all right, you know. It's a it's a it's an economics lecture uh, series, but you know, just say a few words about economics, and then you can move on to some other subject. So maybe that's what I'll do. But um, I did come up with this uh, pretentious uh, title of uh, the myth of economics. Is it called or something like that? Um, they changed uh, uh, um, global warming to to climate change, why not economics to uh, economic change? And there's some truth to that um, uh, formulation uh, uh, from my uh, standpoint. I'm a big skeptic of experts, particularly when it comes to fancy math. And uh, both economics and uh, the climatologist are into that. I remember always being skeptical about uh, climate change. And uh, you know, that not least because, you know, how many decades ago was it? It was global cooling. And then you had the Club of Rome, and we were going to run out of everything. And then we had the population bomb, and all these things are going to destroy us, and they never do, and they always come from the left. Uh, so when the left started getting all giddy about uh, 
global warming, and we're you know we have to stop industry to get the CO2 out of the out of the atmosphere, then um, the, the the small research uh, I've done on this, the thing that struck me the most on climate change was uh, uh, that tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, I don't know how far back they go in the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the scientists who dig up these ice cores in Antarctica, uh, but they dig them up and it shows that there's like a 300 year lag between um, increased um, uh, temperatures on Earth and increase CO2 concentrations, and how could that be? I've always thought that the, you know the the sun is a pretty big deal, and uh, our little efforts to put CO2 in the air doesn't have much uh, in the ability to compete with the sun. But the idea from those findings, those ice core findings, it seems to me, is that uh, the uh, um, the sun plays the key role. It takes 300 years to warm up the earth or more. And once you uh, warm up the earth, then the ocean gets warm and then it lets all this. The ocean is, after all, the biggest provider of, of uh, uh, CO2, greenhouse gases. And so that made sense to me. And I still haven't heard anybody really kind of explain that. Um, but it's it's consistent with my idea that we're a little over overly uh, uh, optimistic about what we can do economically too. I don't mean by by the way in, in, in saying the myth of economics. Uh, I'm not talking about microeconomics, which clearly is true. I mean, you raise the price of something, and you're going to sell fewer products. You put a price control on it, and there's going to be a shortage down the road. So those things are all obvious and documented. It's the macro stuff that gets me concerned. And, um, and so again, <clears throat> with some humility, because I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm going to tell you about a few of the different uh, schools of economic thought and why I'm skeptical about how important they are. Um, certainly, uh, each of these schools is interesting in its own right in that they create a cottage industry a, um, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, wings of departments of economics and universities devoted to this school. Uh, there are fancy conferences in Paris that you fly to and lots of lectures and, and lots of things going on. And within each of these disciplines, there is a lot of, uh, of uh, specialization. Uh, so it's a, it's a dynamic, profitable thing to create a new school of economic thought. Now, the, the cool one was, was Keynesianism. And most of these schools have some kind of insight that, you know, uh, breaks all this money loose and gets people's attention. Uh, Keynesianism, not so much. It was, it, was, it was what Hayek called the fatal conceit, and a bunch of smart people sitting around and saying, you know, we could really manipulate this economy and make it hum. Uh, if only they'd give us the power to do it. And so the issue was aggregate demand and uh, we, is there enough of it? Is there not enough of it? Uh, should we uh, increase taxes, lower taxes? Mostly they want to increase taxes, the Keynesians, but um, should we uh, increase federal spending? Which the great Keynesian Obama did and it didn't, uh, didn't work out so well, I guess. But that, uh, that was something that was kind of a, a battleground for a long time without a lot of sophisticated uh, rejoinders to it because you had the best and the brightest and they'd sit in front of the cameras and go on at some length and you didn't understand a word they were saying but they sure seemed smart. Um, and then, uh, you know, when I, I went to Berkeley in the 60s and um, so I, I had to study Keynesianism. Econ 101 at Berkeley in the 60s was Keynes. And one of the things I had to learn was uh, uh, 
uh, about the Phillips curve, and uh, and I couldn't figure it out. It didn't make any sense to me. And even if it had made sense to me, um, my math skills were so bad I couldn't have done it anyway. So, um, so I was thrilled. Uh, in the 70s, when we had stagflation, I realized I didn't have to learn that after all. It didn't make any sense. Um, but in any event, the, the, uh, in response to this, at least in part, uh, we, we, we got monetarism. Uh, Milton Friedman was a dear friend of mine and several people in this room. Uh, a great man. A man who uh, doesn't get credit for his passion for liberty, as he should, because everyone says, well, he's the ultimate empiricist. And I just don't think that's true. I think if he confronted Milton with a system that would increase economic prosperity but decrease human liberty and make him choose between that and one that would increase human liberty and, and supposedly decrease uh, economic uh, prosperity, he, he'd pick the former. Um, so, or he'd pick the, the, the latter at it. But he is, um, he's gone and uh, a lot of the advocates of monetarism are not as visible as they used to be, but the, the you know again there there are so many schools within monetarism and and uh, um, the insight that they had it seems to me and again all these insights are often you know unique but not particularly profound. The more of uh, any commodity you have, the less value each unit of it will have, and that's kind of my definition of monetarism and. And um, uh, certainly, uh, Anna Schwartz and Milton and uh, the others uh, uh, shook up the economics profession by uh, making it clear how important monetary policy was, because it was really, you know, uh, kind of uh, implausibly ignored for so long. And they made that a big part of economics, and that was an important uh, contribution. One of the other things I liked about Milton, which really doesn't have anything to do with policy, is his uh, willingness to uh, speak to any audience. Uh, he was such a gentleman and such a, um, you know, he never spoke down to anyone. I mean, he could speak down to Nobel laureates if he wanted to, but anyone, you know, somebody in a gas station pumping gas for him would ask him a question and he would be just as nice and and thoughtful as he could be, and uh, I think there are more more people should follow that uh, uh, that approach. You know, of course, Jim Buchanan from GMU was incredible in that regard. So there you have uh, monetarism, a brilliant uh, uh, dissection of that uh, school of thought. Um, and then uh, let me see, what can I go to? Rational expectations, Robert Lucas and. Uh, and the insight there was that, uh, despite what the government thinks, uh, people actually do respond to change circumstances. So that if the government says, well, we're going to increase dramatically the tax on dividends, um, it turns out everyone goes out and sells their, their high dividend stocks and buys low dividend stocks. And the government's sitting around saying, Jesus, this didn't generate the income we thought it was going to. Just as if they said in order to um, you know, deal with the unfunded liabilities of Social Security, we're going to shoot every redhead. And the, and the stormtroopers go outside and they come back and report, Jesus, nobody's got red hair. And uh, so that's rational expectations. Um, uh, public choice, of course, is uh, at a home here. and and still does, and um, uh, Jim Buchanan, as I said, was a gentleman's gentleman, a brilliant man who, it wasn't just economics, it's the whole concept of, of uh, the theory of governance and constitutional issues that uh, he gave so much thought to and was so uh, brilliant in, in explaining how we can have a civil society that has rules that allows us to get along, and uh, and uh, and he was you know, worked with uh, Crazy Gordon Tullock, and 
And their insight was, it turns out bureaucrats and politicians are just like the rest of us. They are self-interested. And now again, that's not a profound insight, but they were the ones who came up with the thought and turned it into a, a, a good school. And, um, and the public choice dynamic is part of the, the literature now. Everyone understands it. Uh, next one I would uh, mention is supply side economics, which is interesting because I'm a, you know, I'm a big free market guy. I believe in capitalism, and um, and yet I'm not a big fan of the supply siders, and the reason is that uh, their insight was that um, uh, incentives matter, and that. If you reduce marginal tax rates and reduce the <coughs> regulatory burden, the you know the animal uh, powers of the uh, uh, of the economy will manifest themselves, and you'll get stronger economic growth. But it's the way they did it that really uh, uh, turned out, in my view, to be counterproductive. Now, uh, Jack Kemp was one of the leaders of this. He wasn't really a scholar, but he was a smart guy, and uh, but he. Uh, was from uh, Buffalo, New York, and uh, it's a big union town, and, and Jack hardly ever met a spending program he didn't like. Uh, and the real guru was Jude Winiski, and Jude, to his credit, always said, look, I'm a big government Democrat. I'm a, I'm a supply sider because I want to grow the government, and the way to grow the government is to create an economy that's going to spin off more tax dollars. And, uh, but the problem is both Jack and, and Jude and Art Laffer, they all had a strategy that said, it's a sucker's game to talk about spending cuts. Now Jude called it the two Santa Claus theory, that uh, one Santa Claus gives you presents, the other one comes in and takes them away. How can you win that battle? Um, and the problem with it was that um, so many of the best and the brightest in the 70s and 80s um, signed up as, as supply siders, and to the extent they were saying, well, the market works better with incentives, good for them. But too many of them signed off on the strategy of not talking about spending cuts. And uh, to this day, uh, the Republican Party or any advocate of limited government suffers tremendously from the lack of rigorous analysis and an ability to say, why is the government doing that? The only question is, you know, the, 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 the reason the Republicans got a little backbone in this last debate over the sequester toward the end is because it was across the board. They didn't have to say, well, I don't think we should spend money on the Department of Education or the military budget's too high, I'm going to cut that. They just say, if anyone complains about what's being cut, they say, well, it's, it was across the board. I didn't have any choice in that. And that, again, is a result of the supply side revolution, in my view. So they, that has to be overcome, this kind of unwillingness to say, uh, this is the role of government. You know, you, uh, uh, Buchanan knew all about that, but he was too much of a gentleman to want to engage in that policy by policy debate. But we need people to do that. And finally, we have the Austrians that I've always been most attracted to, not least because of my lack of mathematical ability. And uh, I'm sure the people in this room have the same sentiment. Um, you had Mises with Human Action, which I always had on my coffee table, never read. And uh, Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State, A Poor Man's Human Action, which I did read most of. Um, and I just... Uh, the insights in general were so profound that one couldn't help but be attracted to Austrianism. At least I couldn't. Uh, certainly the, their insight was subjectivism. One of the great um, uh, examples they have is uh, to say that interpersonal value judgments are, uh, you, you can't compare that you, as an individual, can say, well, here's my list of the top 10 things that I think are most important in my life. And then somebody else can do the same thing, but you can't compare the two. You can only list them ordinarily, not cardinally. 
which is one of the great failings of econometrics. That econometrics too often is simply a process of guesses multiplied by guesses divided by guesses. My good my friend, the late Bill Niskanen, who was chairman of the Cato Institute for many years, uh, and himself, in, in my view, took economics much too seriously. But on the other hand, he understood economics, so maybe that was okay. Um, but he used to say, why, uh, why are there numbers to the right of the decimal point? And his answer was to prove that economists have a sense of humor. That's a joke. That's a good one. <laughs> and you, you all work on it. Um, because um, of the lack of, of uh, let me see, there's, there's a thing in the, uh, in the uh, Wall Street Journal <clears throat> just the other day, October 14, about the new um, Chicago uh, Nobel laureate, um, uh, what is he, Chicago Peter, uh, Lars Peter Hansen? Where is he from? Chicago. Chicago, that's what I thought. Um, and it says, um, in challenges in identifying and measuring systemic risk, uh, uh, Mr. Hansen writes that, uh, quote, the term has become a grab bag and asks, should systemic risk be an explicit target of measurement or should it be relegated to being a buzzword, a slogan, or a code word used to rationalize regulatory discretion? The noblest then recalls Lord Kelvin's dictum that when something cannot be measured or expressed in numbers, your knowledge is of the meager and unsatisfactory kind. And I think that is a very profound statement in, in that so much of what is presented as economic knowledge to the public and the media is just guesses. And it doesn't deserve the gravity of appreciation that the world gives it. Um, so, let me see, I mentioned Rothbard and Mises, Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, uh, and, the, and his discussion of the economic calculation problem was, was a brilliant contribution uh, to understanding how the world works. One of the um, uh, things I've always uh, had a concern with with Austrians is their um, discussion of the business cycle. I think they're on to something, but I think um, much of it, certainly in the early years, was not a theory of the business cycle so much as a description of the Great Depression. And, um, and so it's not simply a question of lower interest rates uh, leading to uh, uh, expansion of industrial capacity uh, over expansion then and uh, and uh, the uh, uh, the malinvestment that leads to recessions there is malinvestment but it, it it's very subtle the way it occurs it could well be uh, simply uh, transfer payments uh, depending on how the new money enters the um, the economy so let me um, move on then to something more current, um, and that is um, that my thought is a misunderstanding of economics really got us into the mess we're in today, and that misunderstanding came during the Great Depression. Um, and whether it was uh, other scholars, the media, uh, the business community, people were blindsided by the Depression. and. Um, they wanted to blame it on something, and the, they blamed it on laissez-faire capitalism. And that was a huge, huge mistake, because it was actually government flexing its new muscles with the Federal Reserve and, and uh, other uh, machinations in international credit uh, issues that, uh, that led to this thing. And then, of course, it was greatly ex exacerbated with um, uh, with, the, with the idiotic policies that Hoover and FDR followed, you know, <laughs> slaughtering animals to keep farm prices up. Uh, it's amazing they didn't slaughter humans to keep wages up, but uh, they, uh, they did a lot of very stupid things, uh, in, in, including artificially keeping wages up. And, whoa, unemployment, who knew? Um, 
so the, the, the policies of FDR created a, a prolonged depression, which just ended up exacerbating the, the concern over capitalism. Uh, and just the opposite should have been, you know, what was it, 2021, when we had a very sharp uh, economic retraction, the government didn't do anything, and by 22 and 23, everything was fine uh, because the economy could adjust. Uh, but when you put all these levers in there, it just, you know, it makes it impossible. Um, that's a lesson um, young people don't learn today. Um, but anyway, um, it's interesting when you come out of the Great Depression and, and uh, the New Deal, which was a complete repudiation of our constitutional system of government that had worked so well for so long, 150 years, um, there was a reaction to it. Hayek would have understood that, probably did. Uh, the idea that, you know, he believed in cultural evolution and that it had deep roots in societies. It takes a long time for kind of traditions and cultural norms to develop. And, um, and in the United States, uh, that, uh, the key thing to me was the respect for the dignity of the individual. They didn't, Americans, and to this day, do not like government or big business telling them what to do. That's why most good big businesses now don't tell people what to do. They're, they really work very hard to make sure you're happy. Um, but anyway, um, we came out of that depression with a lot of people wondering, what the hell was that all about? And you had people, you know, you know these soup kitchens and, and uh, horrible uh, situation for living. But if you, if you count the end of the New Deal in 1952, when Eisenhower uh, defeated uh, Stevenson, the, uh, uh, within eight years, the number one selling political book in America was um, The Conscience of a Conservative by Barry Goldwater, which I recommend everyone to read today. I mean, there's some glitches in there, but for the most part, it's a really fine uh, critique of the New Deal and a call to return to the original constitutional construct, which um, worked so well and would work today if we, if we could uh, uh, just get the right people to understand it. Um, one of the problems we have, um, you know, Goldwater lost, but he started something. Now, there's an article in the, in the Post this morning by George Will where he makes the point that he's talking about uh, Robert Sarbus, the libertarian, uh, I think he, didn't he go to GMU? I think he may have. Um, and, and still is doing well, who knew? And, uh, and he makes, um, uh, he, he alluded to Bill Buckley's run for uh, mayor of New York back, you know, 40 years, 50 years ago, when, when Buckley was asked, uh, uh, what are you going to do if you win? And he said, famously, uh, uh, demand a recount. And, and, but he said he got 13.2% of the vote or whatever it was. And, he, and that started something that led to his brother getting elected to the U.S. Senate and added to the intellectual firepower of the conservative movement. Now, I'm proudly not a conservative. I'm a libertarian. Uh, but the libertarian movement is gaining ground in this country. I believe a plurality of Americans are uh, socially tolerant. They don't give a damn what people do in their own homes. They are... Uh, for the market, they're for dynamic market capitalism, not crony capitalism, but they're for capitalism. And they are skeptical about the U.S. trying to be the world's policeman. Now, that's kind of a tricky uh, formulation because it's not all the same people that form, form that plurality. But uh, nevertheless, they, uh, uh, there's a lot of people that can have all three of those views, and uh, that's what's uh, got to be done, to, uh, has to be built on uh, if we're going to save this this country. I, 
one of the great challenges we face as libertarians is the fact that the, and then I'll wrap up, um, is that uh, there, there are people who want to run other people's lives, and there are people who believe in live and let live. Don't even think about trying to tell other people how to live their lives. Which kind of person is more likely to get involved in politics? And if you go to, you know, meet with congressmen, uh, which I've done over the years, typically the Democrat, the big government person is smarter. Because this, the best and the brightest, that's their life. You know, we're going to get in here and, and make these rules and make everything better and tell people how to live. And there's a lot of kind of goofy Republicans that come in there and think this is just, oh, well, this is, we're going to weigh the will of the people and, and vote on this stuff. But there are more and more, and they're, they're just uh, uh, in the last four years, uh, very bright young people who are for limited government and uh, are socially tolerant. And my, uh, my youngest daughter went to work for one today, so I'm for them. Um, but you have that. You have uh, an ideological commitment among people in public policy that is much stronger on the left than it is, and I don't even like to say the right, but it is of those who don't want to run other people's lives. They just don't want to get involved in that battle. And it's too bad. And the other, the other element is public choice. You have people, it's, it's not ideological, the public choice dynamic. It is uh, the way government is set up. They have this money they can get just by pointing a gun at you, and they think they're doing good, and, uh, and, uh, and the government, every tendril of the state is reaching out trying to find some new area it can con control. Not because they're status, because that's, you know, what the, that's what they do. That's what, uh, and so we have to overcome that. But we have to, but people say, oh, it's hopeless. And I think, what about the founders of this country? What about the people who, who, who framed the Constitution? My God, think what they were up against. Millennia of uh, a culture that said the individual doesn't matter. It's a state that's in charge, or the religion, or whatever. And yet they overcame that, you know, walking around in snow with bare feet. And we get people bitching because, you know, they can't get on TV every night. It, it, we have the technological ability to reach everybody, and we have the right ideas. And, um, but we have obstacles, namely the, the greater energy among the ideological statists and the public choice dynamic, which is just there, and there's nothing you can do about it, I think. Anyway, those are my thoughts for what they're worth, and I'd be glad to answer any questions people have. If you have any. You again. known for founding the most influential think tank probably in American history. Libertarian think tank. Uh, yeah, well, okay. I'm willing to go one better. Most influential think tank. I'll, I'll accept that. All right. Uh, and yet, you, you praise public choice. It's a genuine question. If public, to the extent that public choice is an accurate description of reality, and I'm, a, I'm on the faculty at GMU, I think it is an accurate description of reality. And that says, look, it really doesn't matter what, I, what the ideas are. The political dynamic is going to drive government to grow. It's going to drive special interest groups to uh, persuade the state to steal from the, the you know, consumers and give to the concentrated producer groups. So given the public choice dynamic, uh, 
what is it that inspired you to have confidence that running a place like, founding and running a place like Cato would pay off? Why not just give up and say, you know, no matter what ideas we perpetuate, the state's going to grow because of this public choice dynamic? Or is the public choice dynamic, in fact, uh, uh, not so indomitable as, as some people think? Well, I got into it out of extreme naivete, but um, I, uh, no, I don't think it is unbeatable. I mean, we know, I mean, the Tea Party is, when it got started, um, almost all these people were social conservatives, but they didn't push that, and consciously, they said, we want constitutional government and smaller government, and that overcame a lot of stuff that uh, you wouldn't expect it to, to have happen. And now we have, uh, you know, one of the, I didn't actually mention this, but this is one of my themes with the supply siders, is that they have in effect replaced a desire for liberty with a desire for economic growth. And I would argue that the former is much more uh, appealing for a movement and that, that the free market limited government side has lost that emotion and it needs to find it back because um, the, uh, you know, to me, whether we increase uh, GDP, which is, as Austrians know, unmeasurable anyway, but say you in increase it by uh, half of 1%, and that's a big, you know, trillion dollar number is not as important as getting rid of the NSA. Our movement has to be focused on liberty, not on economics, with all due respect to the economists in the room. And, um, and I think that's when you overcome this stuff. When you're really concerned, there's a big thing on the mall Saturday, I think, Saturday or Sunday. Saturday. Yeah, with, with groups from the left and the right and it's all about, I think it's called uh, Stop Looking at Us or Stop Watching Us. Stop watching us. And, and at that point, at some point, people you know, just say, what is this? This is not what this country's about. And so, but it's got to be about liberty and not about economic growth. So that's my final slap at this supply siders. Who's going to get murdered in uh, in the record book? Uh, I beg your pardon. You're going to get murdered in the record record book for Virginia uh, libertarians, aren't you? Uh, yes, I'm going to be in, I'm ready. I'm ready to be buried in that regard. That's fine. I'd love to see Rob Sarvis uh, uh, go twenty thirty fold over what I did. But uh, in any event, um, the index of economic freedom recently. I think Cato has something to do with that. I, I believe that's the right title, where uh, maybe it's the Fraser Institute is involved in it as well. The United States was second in the world in 2000. Now oh, it's like 10th or something? 17th. 17th. In the new version that came out. I fear, based on my interactions with a lot of people, my friends, uh, not libertarian friends, but other friends, and the, I, I think I'm concerned the biggest problem facing this nation is that the American people really don't care much or aren't concerned with the concept of economic freedom? Well, well, that's a legitimate point. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have economic freedom. Don't get me wrong. No, I understand, but I think, I think we're falling in that regard because too many people just don't care about the concept. Yeah. I, you know, I have this uh, thing about uh, Bill Gates and, uh, and uh, who's the oracle of uh, Omaha? Uh, well, yeah, Buffett, these guys who give billions of dollars to um, to help people. And if you have that kind of money, you want to give money to people that need medicine and need food. In the meantime, the systemic causes of the pathologies that they're concerned about continue on. The Economic Freedom of the World Report shows that all the thing, all the pathologies they're concerned about, clean water, infant mortality, longevity, you know, food access, all of these things are a function of economic freedom. And, and I had a discussion with Bill Gates, you know, 20 years ago, 
that actually ended up getting Cato a modest contribution, at least by his standards. But I made that argument with him. Uh, of course you want to spend all this money to help people right now, but wouldn't it be worthwhile for people of your means to spend more time talking about the institutions that create a society where these pathologies go away? Uh, you know, respect for contract, uh, uh, honest judiciary, uh, respect for private property, the whole plethora of issues that combine to make a free enterprise system work. And in doing so, get rid of all this nonsense. There's no reason for suffering in Africa. We know what the answer is. The issue is not what causes poverty. Poverty is man's natural state. The issue is what causes wealth creation. And there's so little in the philanthropic world devoted to explaining to the developing world, not, not to mention the United States, that uh, there are reasons why people create wealth, and, um, and we don't give enough attention to that. Ed, it seemed like in the um, early years of the, the libertarian movement up to, to around 9-11 that most of the focus has been, was on economic liberty. And um, even though I know Cato and lots of other libertarian groups we did, we you know, talked about foreign policy and the, the rise of the garrison state and so forth. But it was really, it seemed to me, a secondary issue compared to economic liberty. And then 9-11 comes along and, and the warfare state rears its ugly head and we, we get all of the, the stuff that, that is now associated with, with the warfare state. Uh, I'm curious as to what you would say is the greatest danger to liberty that is facing people today uh, with respect to the welfare state and the warfare state. Well, the, the warfare state, I've always believed that. People down at the Mises Institute won't believe this, but I'm a Rothbardian, and uh, you know, war is the health of the state, and uh, and there's just no uh, question but that the uh, ability of the uh, of the powers that be to conduct these insane wars, I you know, it just drives me nuts when when every, all you see. On, on cable stations advertising or the wounded warriors, you know, and the soft music and, and uh, give money. And, and these are brave people, and it's horrible what's happened to them. But it, is there anybody saying it didn't have to happen? What the hell good came out of it? Uh, these are not heroes in the sense of, of preserving our liberty. It had nothing to do with our liberty. They're very brave people who unfortunately got hurt. And, um, uh, you know, the, and, 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 the, the, uh, and these, these uh, phony enemies we have around the world are what justifies what the NSA does, which is, to me, it's just been appalling, the lack of uh, outrage. But they, they read every email we have. They don't read it. They have every email. They have every phone call. And, and ev everything we've done on the internet, and it may not need it for 30 years, but when they want to go bumper Hornberger, bumper, did you actually say this? You know, you're, in, you're on trial, and they've got you. And it doesn't, uh, it, it's just uh, so fundamentally uh, un-American. That's why this Snowden guy is more of a hero than he is a criminal, in my opinion. Going back to the late 1940s, early 50s, General MacArthur and General Eisenhower were talking about what they saw developing, which has now become what we're calling the warfare state. They saw this because they were very clearly in line to see what was happening between the large industrialists and the federal government. And they warned about it. 
but it seemed that those warnings went ignored. And I look at what the press picked up on, and it seems that the press simply did not warn the people about this sort of thing. They seemed to take another approach. And I was wondering, how much do you credit or maybe blame the, uh, what we call the mainstream media for putting the people into such a state of complacency? And how much would you say blame the way the government has controlled the educational system? Because it seems that the children are being taught things that just aren't true, but there's too little complaints about it. I, uh, those are good points. Um, my three kids are finally out of college. You know, they got started late. I was supposed to be a bachelor, but this little blonde from Alabama had other ideas. I've never seen such tenacity. But anyway, <laughs> these, uh, my kids are out of school, and I always say, the bad news is what they were taught. The good news is they didn't learn any of it. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but your point is very well taken, and the, the key is generation after generation of kids being uh, uh, schooled in government schools. And they're, they're not teaching anything about uh, limited government or, uh, you know, other than, you know, do what the, the politicians tell you to do. And the media is the same way. They have the contacts. Uh, each one uh, has... has people either in, at the state level or at the congressional level who they depend on for information. And you start becoming critical of uh, government policies and you find that as a journalist, you're not getting the scoop, you're not getting the stories and your editor wants to know why. And so it's very much go along to get along and uh, it's a problem. I, I, the, the advent of the internet and, and all of the alternative sources of information is a very healthy thing, and it can be for education too, I believe. That, uh, you know, if I was uh, starting out with kids now, I'd want them, I want to find uh, educational alternatives to the schools. And um, so I think there is hope there too. Okay. Uh oh. As the founder of a, you know, such an influential think tank, uh, for the students in the room who are majoring in economics, could you give them any advice on seeking jobs in the nonprofit world, you know, and in policy analysis uh, after they graduate? Well, <clears throat> there are a lot more jobs in that area than there were before Cato got started. Uh, so. Uh, I think my, my youngest daughter, the only one who got the libertarian gene, um, wants to uh, work for a think tank down the road. Um, I'd rather that the best and the brightest in this room get rich and uh, fund the uh, various uh, organizations that are trying to uh, promote liberty because they're out there and they're so we are so incredibly overwhelmed by the money on the left and, and the right. I mean, the right is just as, as uh, the, uh, the, the stuff they, the, the, you know, who funds uh, the Weekly Standard? This is, a, this is a magazine that is just a drumbeat for war. And um, they have tremendous resources that, that uh, the libertarian side doesn't have, and I think that's partly because of this pre-selection process that the people who are successful entrepreneurs and uh, they just don't want to get involved in public policy. I run into that. I used to be, you know, as president of the Cato Institute, I was just a glorified fundraiser. And I'd run into people all the time saying, oh, please, you can't do anything. And um, I don't believe that. I mean, I, I think of the Valley Forge guys in there without shoes. Okay? Thank you. <laughs>